Good morning and welcome everyone to our webinar today on the power of collaboration in fostering urban and economic resilience through the empowerment of small and medium enterprises. My name is Lauren Sorkin and I'm the Executive Director of the Resilient Cities Network. I am pleased to be here to facilitate this session, which is co-convened with my esteemed former colleagues from the Asian Development Bank. This virtual session sets out to illuminate the pivotal role that SMEs play in building resilient urban environments and how we can learn from recent work in Southeast Asia to strengthen SMEs in our cities to build a safer, more equitable and sustainable future for all. As we begin, I will ask Jia Thu to share a few words of introduction. Jia is an urban development specialist for Southeast Asia and Pacific water and urban development sector at the Asian Development Bank. He is driving investment in urban solutions and infrastructure. Jia, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are very keen to partner with Resilient Cities Network and Economic Research Institute for ASEAN East, East Asia to co-host this very important webinar on empowering SMEs for urban resilience and proposing various uh, solutions. Uh, SMEs and uh, MSMEs are very critical driving force in the Southeast Asian economies, accounting for an average of 97% of all the enterprises, 69% of the national labor force, and 41% of the country's uh, GDPs from 2010 to 2019 in the region. In fact, Southeast Asia's robust growth over the past 10 years have been underpinned by SMEs, according to the 2020 ADB study. However, while they are the backbone of the region's economy, in reality, SMEs and MSMEs are very fragile. This was apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic. A rapid stu uh, study or survey conducted by ADB in March and May 2020 in the wake of the lockdowns showed that the immediate shutdowns of majority of the SMEs in Lao PDR and the Philippines and nearly half of the SMEs in Indonesia and Thailand. In 2020, ADB study also showed that Immediately after the lockdowns, domestic demand dropped for 40% of the SMEs fall in the Lao and Thailand, and 30% of the businesses in Indonesia and Philippines. The survey also found supply disruptions in more than 30% of SMEs in the Philippines and Thailand, and close to 20% in Lao PDR in Indonesia. Uh, today, globally, we are all facing an unprecedented challenge of climate change-related shocks and stresses, uh, pattern change in typhoon cyclones, in the region, uh, flood in both urban and non-urban non areas, uh, air quality issues, uh, droughts, disruptions, landslides, earthquakes. All are putting enormous pressure on SMEs uh, in the region, uh, giving their scope and impact, uh, not just on the national economy, but also on the economies of the cities where they are based. Uh, SMEs clearly play a key role in building urban resilience for climate change, for both mitigation and adaptation, for preparation for various shocks and stresses for pandemics, economic downturns, and other potential threats. Uh, again, uh, we would like to thank our seats and regional partners, uh, representatives from the SMEs and all who are joining this webinar for the efforts. And we look forward to the uh, fruitful discussions. Thank you. Over to you, Laura. Cheers. Thank you, John. As you've heard from his opening, the statistics are very clear. In a, wor in a world where urban landscapes are constantly evolving, SMEs have emerged as the unsung heroes, driving economic growth, nurturing social cohesion, and facilitating sustainable development. Today, we stand at the intersection of rapid change, and these enterprises have never been more critical in our journey towards urban resilience. Over the past three years, marked by the global pandemic that reshaped all of our perspectives, we've come to recognize the profound importance of collaborative urban ecosystems. These ecosystems where public and private sector collaborate are breeding grounds for nurturing SMEs and equipping them with what they need to overcome challenges and unleash their full potential as catalysts for urban and economic resilience. For the Resilient Cities Network, the concept of resilience extends far beyond mere survival. It encompasses a city's capacity not only to withstand chronic stresses and acute shocks, but to survive, to adapt and to grow. Economic resilience transcends recovery. It means we have to foster an economy that not only stabilizes post-pandemic, but also harnesses growth to fortify our households, our businesses, our institutions, 
and puts forward a more prosperous urban landscape. Today, you're going to hear from additional experts in SME development and urban resilience. Many have participated with Resilient Cities Network or in ADB in catalyzing city resilience and working with SMEs, including a program with City Foundation. In this program, we identified three sectors, community tourism, waste management, and green industry as linchpins for recovery and long-term sustainability. We're going to talk about the impacts of this initiative, which are noteworthy, but also others that can foster better resilience knowledge and how we can move forward. So I wanna challenge this audience to start thinking about what we've learned and how together we can continue to foster better resilience knowledge among city officials, ways to continue to enhance SME government collaboration, and how we can continue to boost the quality and capacity of SMEs in meeting our needs. As we embark on this learning journey together today, I'm very excited to introduce our esteemed panel of speakers. Each of them is a trailblazer in their own right. First, I will introduce then Katachalam Anbumozi or Anbu. Anbu is the Director of Research and Strategy and Innovation at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. His expertise lies in strategic innovation and in sustainable development. Our next speaker, Ahmad Jafari, is a Senior Officer in the Regional Development Planning Agency or BAPEDA in Jakarta, and he brings more than 20 years of experience in roles such as the Head of Economics, and he has an urban economic master's from Universitas Indonesia and an MBA from Nanyang Tech. We'll also hear from Bunga Asi Radihianatia, who is a program officer at Kotakita Foundation. She will bring expertise to this conversation in climate adaptation, in urban resilience and community development through a participatory approach. Last but not least, I'm very pleased to introduce Nini Purwajati, who is the senior manager of programs and knowledge in Asia and the Pacific at Resilient Cities Network. And she is a leader in driving local economic recovery and community resilience in the region. In this session, we aim to uncover these strategies and stories that are shaping our urban and economic resilience one SME at a time. So without further ado, let's dive in and explore how collaboration, innovation, and shared vision can pave the way for a more resilient future. Nini, please start us off with an overview of the Catalyzing City Resilience Solutions Program. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Uh, before I start, I will play a short video on Catalyzing City Resilience Solutions, or program on SME resilience. The COVID-19 pandemic caused a major economic shock, and we see that SMEs were majorly impacted. Saya sebagai peniaga yang orang kata peniaga kecil-kecilan yang berada di negeri Melaka ni memang terasa sangatlah semasa semasa Covid a uh, di mana saya terpaksa tutup saya punya perniagaan pada masa tu. Pada saat itu kita benar-benar dihempaskan kurang lebih 2 tahun. Itu me in the Debangmot Kanel community were hit hard with the sudden loss of income due to the loss of visitors. Looking at Asia specifically, um, we, we know that SMEs are a central driver of local economic development. SMEs are providing jobs and livelihoods to um, large parts of um, the, the population in Asian cities. The Resilient Cities Network wants to work with the City Foundation because we are recognizing that bringing the public sector and the private sector together to develop solutions for urban resilience is critical. Catalyzing City Resilience Solutions build partnership between cities' government and the SME sectors to work together towards developing solutions that both address COVID-19 recovery while contributing to the resilience of the local communities and the cities. Thank you. Um, those video, despite uh, that video, despite short, I think providing the context and then you know, you listen to what's actually happening on the ground, and that's why we as city practitioners we really really need to work together with SMEs. And 
don't worry that was a bit meta because you saw me in the video but i'll make sure that you also hear from the other am amazing panelists i'm super excited to share uh, the panel uh, i want to start with why especially us uh, as city practitioners as i mentioned need to work together with smes and the fact that so many people um, are actually connecting here this this morning uh, in asia and uh, afternoon evening in other places it's a testament of the importance of smes we saw in the video and we heard the stat as also shared by joe uh, different sources will have slightly different numbers but they are consistent sme has and provide the huge contribution to the economy provides the job creation etc but smes are more than just businesses they're obvious, obviously the backbone of our local com economies, driving growth, but also fostering innovation and connecting communities. From cities' perspective, with their often deep roots uh, to their locality, to their community, with their agile model, um, and then also their opportunity for innovations, SMEs are very critical. Um, and also, they will also bring other benefits such as social cohesion. But one thing that we need to highlight here, there's the paradox with SME. Despite their strengths, uh, SME is very, very vulnerable uh, to various uh, shock. And again, Joe already covered the, the example. Uh, we have obviously pandemic, aging population. Uh, the, there are regulatory challenges and obviously environmental uh, degradation. And we've seen this during the COVID-19 crisis. Their fragility can also be stumbling block to urban resilience. And I guess we have to also be honest here. Um, the limitation the SME has uh, also sometimes may result in situation like poor working condition or improper waste pollution. So they're both impacted, but they're also partly uh, contributing uh, to these challenges. Um, and then uh, there was also a research, for example, uh, from uh, ICS uh, use of Ishak here in Singapore about the huge contribution of the emission uh, by SME. So, so we cannot ignore this. Um, and also it's critical that we avoid at least mentality, such as, you know, at least people have a job because of SME, that's not enough. Looking at this paradox, we need to reflect uh, on this vulnerability and versatility of SMEs. Us at uh, Resilient Cities Network, we firmly believe that strengthening SMEs is critical, essential to build resilience community, resilient cities, and resilient societies. Um, the video provided an introduction on the Catalyzing City Resilient Solution Program. So this is a program with the generous support from the City Foundation, where we implemented uh, together with six cities in Southeast Asia. They're Jakarta, Semarang, Bangkok, Malacca, Danang, and Kanto. And you'll hear more from Jakarta, uh, who is also joining today's panel. And the program aims to help cities, local economy recovers from COVID-19 by empowering and strengthening a critical SME sector to continue uh, to develop and provide solutions that will allow cities to build um, urban resilience. So I'm just gonna share uh, just a quick slide to give. As uh, Lauren previously mentioned, uh, we're looking um, at three critical uh, sector here uh, with this program. Uh, two cities, they're working on community tourism. Two cities, uh, they're working on green industry. Two cities, uh, they're working on waste uh, management. These are examples of a critical sector in the city that is very interlinked to SMEs. Uh, and in approaching our program uh, as a city network, we're listening to the city uh, and then really encouraging city to think um, in a very holistic way, yes, how can we help 
SMEs, but how can we link that to the broader uh, resilience challenges in the city? So then when we are supporting SMEs, we're also tackling and addressing those other challenges. Um, this was a, a program designed in the early days of COVID-19. So a lot of this was focusing on the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, disruption. Um, again, because we recognize how SMEs, despite uh, they're very critical and has many potential for the employment and community livelihood, for example, are vulnerable to shock. This program was a response to that uh, critical need. So how can we uh, in Resilient Cities Network, as City Network, working with cities in uh, strengthening SMEs? Um, we have multi-pronged approach, but first and foremost, obviously we are working together with the local government. Um, they need to um, improve the understanding, uh, working closely with SMEs in a more equal way, um, understanding which are the most vulnerable communities uh, of SMEs in their cities, um, because we strongly believe that city won't be resilient uh, if they are not supporting these most vulnerable uh, SMEs in the city. Um, in working together with SMEs, we're pioneering ways to increase collaboration between the public, which is public sector, which is the local government itself, SMEs, and local communities. We deploy many co-design approach uh, together with the SMEs, together with the cities, and also tapping into both local partners or new partner um, outside the city um, to implement, uh, to co-design and then later implement pilot solution that focus on both the recovery of the SMEs, but also addressing climate resilience and other challenges. And as a network, we have the mandate to ensure that this learning, uh, we are capturing them, but we also sharing them. And today is uh, an example um, in how we are starting to share the learning uh, for a feedback loop and we're looking forward that uh, there are more input than we can improve how we can work together with um, SMEs. With that, uh, a bit uh, more detail about how we uh, approach the program. So our program is guided by four key uh, principles. First and foremost, we try to understand and prioritize the city critical and vulnerable SME sector. So we are working with cities in defining and identifying those SME sector. We try to ensure that we link uh, with multiple resilience challenges in the city. Um, for example, looking at water pollution, uh, looking at obviously the, the pandemic uh, uh, shocks and looking at, um, for example, aging population. Um, and in working together with the, the SMEs, we're really trying to foster a spirit of cooperation that strengthen the SMEs ecosystem in the city. And then lastly, when we're working on the co-design, when we are trying to implement those pilot solutions, we are integrating resilience co-benefits um, for the uh, longer term outcome uh, in the city. So what are the key lessons and the way forward? Um, there's no single recipe uh, for success, but we can clearly see that collaboration stands out as a universal ingredient. Um, beyond working with these six uh, cities in Southeast Asia, the program also enable us to synthesize, to capture learning from other cities in our network as well. Like we have Kyoto, Quito, and Melbourne, for example, and we are excited to share them in this uh, a point of view, empowering SMEs for urban resilience document. Having this point of view is important 
uh, when working collaboratively with multiple stakeholders to build a safer, more equitable and sustainable future for all. It gives us guides, uh, guidance for our effort, helping us and our cities to understand uh, what we are collectively trying to do, what should be our priorities and how to approach um, uh, our work. Uh, it's also a motivator for us because it's a reminder for us why we need to work with SMEs, why SMEs link to urban resilience, um, especially uh, during this challenging time. Uh, and then to inspire change, capturing all this uh, learning um, for later application um, to scaling up so then we can really uh, bring transformation to more cities. Um, in this point of view document that I'm inviting you to deep dive further later on, I think uh, our team will share the link. There are many lessons learned to reflect uh, from the diverse case studies, but for now, one thing that I want to highlight, local government must approach working with SMEs in a systemic way, building on their mandate and filling the blind spot uh, as SME would focus more on their individual survival during crisis. So for example, the cases from Quito uh, in Ecuador on food resilience and urban farmers, uh, you need to check that one, it's very interesting case. And Kyoto on activating local tourism during the peak of pandemic, highlight the role of local government to play as connector, uh, to provide the enabling environment to help F SMEs to navigate those crises. Uh, the importance of data also cannot be overlooked. So again, uh, ref uh, referring back to the food resilience and urban farmers uh, initiative in Quito, uh, the mapping in Quito food uh, industry was very critical and that was helping uh, the overall program uh, leading to more efficient supply chain, improve the food um, security, but also helping urban farmers uh, in Quito from an uh, economic point of view. Um, I will stop here. Again, I'm inviting you to deep dive further into the point of view document. I'm looking forward to hear from other panelists and looking forward for a really productive discussion. Uh, the synergy between SMEs and cities, not just to be discussed and later on, uh, we need to really work together, forging new ways to make our cities more resilient, our communities more vibrant and our future more secure. Thank you and over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Nini. I think you highlighted some extremely important points and I wanted to come back to them. C collaboration here is key, articulating needs and developing a common understanding of the role of SMEs in the city and empowering them to take on this role and serve their communities. In terms of priorities, Nini, you shared that building up collaboration must be done in a systemic way. And I don't think that that can be overstated. We also know that our current situation, that crises will continue to come is a motivator. And given that that is the case, working with SMEs builds a muscle so that when those crises come, the SMEs can not only survive, but navigate the crisis and then contribute to solutions. The point of view link is now in the chat and this shares lessons from this work so that you can apply this in what you're doing. I see also, and I, I want to thank those who are putting questions in to the chat, please continue to do so. We are going to come to those later in the session. Nini, thank you again for giving us that regional view. Um, we now are going to dive deeper into some specific city examples. So we're going to open up our panel discussion with Jakarta and Kotakita. So first, I'd like to come to you, Pakchifari, to tell us about what efforts has Jakarta undertaken in supporting SMEs while tackling other overlapping resilience challenges. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a kind uh, great time for me, especially to our government, to share what uh, I will learn 
from our network with the RCN and also the objects uh, for the Kota Kita as a partner, then our project at uh, Kota Baru. Uh, reflecting the rules of the government of Jakarta in terms of the uh, SME, we actually has a program. We call it the Jakarta Entrepreneurs Programs it's since 2017. That actually has a crucial catalyst for fostering the entrepreneurship and economic growth within the regions. These initiatives are designed to empower the local individuals with innovative ideas, uh, offering them the necessary resources and support to transform their concept into a thriving business. So the program is uh, support uh, from the various uh, city department at the local level, local government level, I mean, such as a small and medium enterprise department, agriculture and food security, tourism and creativity economy, social welfare, women's empowerment and child protection, manpower and energy, and also uh, all the department that related to the uh, this program. And this program is coordinated by the uh, Department of Small and Medium Enterprises. At the first, we see that uh, our program is has two main objectives. First is generating employment opportunity uh, and also job creation. Yeah. And the second one is nurturing the entrepreneurships with activities aimed at the benefit uh, to the local community. Then what we we'll, what we'll, we'll do at that time? Yeah. So uh, all the department has uh, seven staff uh, program to create the entrepreneurship, dealing with the uniqueness that the, each department has. Yeah. Uh, starting from the uh, providing the access to the registering for the local community to start their business. Yeah. Uh, to assist the licensing in terms of the starting for business. One coming up uh, also with the mentorship, and then uh, funding and also the networking opportunities uh, that we uh, broaden up to all the uh, private sectors. The Jakarta uh, Entrepreneurs Programs not only encourage the spirit of the entrepreneurship, but also contributes to the diversification of the city economy. Through these efforts, uh, I think we we see that the government aims to create a dynamic ecosystem yeah, that nurtures homegrown talent, stimulates generation uh, and position Jakarta as a vibrant hub uh, for the startup and innovation. So a critical phase of a uh, facilitate uh, such as collaboration is aligning the stakeholders uh, with clear and shared objective. Each department brings a unique skill set to the table and diversity is harms to maximize impact. The training provided by this department is tailored to their expertise. For example, a small medium enterprise department covering industry like the culinary, fashion and crafts and delivered industry specific training, something like that. Uh, agriculture and food security department focus on uh, agriculture cultivation uh, training, while tourism and creative in economic department emphasize tourism and the creative sectors. So finally, uh, right now we have at least 300,000 uh, micro and SMEs uh, registered to our dashboard yeah. that have joined the Jakarta Entrepreneur System. And this business uh, benefit from a range of the city provided resources. Uh, as what I mentioned before, from training, uh, the mentoring to licensing assistance and also the marketing support and the the significant one is to to giving also the uh, 
information about the financial reporting tools. We have that. Uh, we hope that our SMAs also has a capability to uh, report the financial to give the sustain the business. Yeah. And even across to the capital, entrepreneurs uh, can connect through the local district, all the Jakarta entrepreneurs online, where they are uh, guided to the business mentor. Uh, 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 who provide a tailor so. so Jakarta provincial government in this context yeah, because we want to support the enhancement of SMA that we uh, connect uh, or we unite in the dashboard to exemplify this in fact e-order platform it means that uh, there is some platform that we create that got create to connect between uh, jakarta preneurs jakarta entrepreneurs and also the buyers we call it the e-order platform department i mean department from the government of jakarta across the city use this platform to order supplies and micro SMEs can showcase their products directly connecting with the potential buyers. So this integration of the technology is a testament to how modern tools can booster the traditional business system. And then uh, the one notable facet that Jakarta Enterprise Program is there emphasize on inclusivity and collaboration. This initiate prioritize the participation of various sectors and graphics, yeah. encouraging the women and uh, local community to actively engage in entrepreneurial endeavors. By promoting and diversity and equity, the government seek to harness uh, the full spectrum to creativity and uh, potential the Jakarta population of person. So as the result, uh, the city entrepreneurial landscapes become richer and more reflective uh, of its people aspirations. Overall, the Jakarta Entrepreneur Program stands as testament to Jakarta commitment to driving economic uh, progress through innovation uh, entrepreneurs and community driven initiatives. So finally, uh, back uh, to the other programs, uh, Jakarta still have to keep this uh, Jakarta Entrepreneurs Program, even though we know uh, there is some changing will be for the uh, uh, the leaders. I think yeah. because this. Uh, the program is very uh, significant, important, even in the situation like a catastrophic when the pandemic situation happened. Uh, small, medium enterprise uh, still have resilience um, to keep the condition like. I think uh, that's our um, brief related to the what the governments do or what the governments effort in terms of the uh, small medium enterprise uh, enrichment. Thank you. Back to Laura. Thank you very much. I really appreciate Pak Jafari how you've shared about the Jacqueline program and also the experience working with our cities. I think you shared very clearly how technology and intentional tools for entrepreneurs can really boost their participation and their success. And also, I think it's very important that we all recognize the inclusive approach that you highlighted, that you need to pay attention and target women or other groups that have historically had less opportunity to get them support and get them involved in SME development. I want to now turn to Bunga. Um, in Kalibaru, 
what collaborations are happening with the community to empower SMEs? How are these programs aligning with broader goals? There was already a question in the chat about the SDGs. How do you see this work aligning with the SDGs mission in Jakarta? Okay, thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, so um, actually Jakarta also had uh, built a collaboration model in SEP district level um, in uh, which one we just talked about in Kalibaru, Chilinching in North Jakarta uh, called Kalibaru Hub. Um, actually, Kalu Kalibaru is one of the first SEP district and they face so many shock and stresses. So fostered by the SDGs in Jakarta, the government and multiple civil society organizations are working hand in hand to fulfill the SDGs advancement and tackling several critical issues in Kalibaru, such as basic services, waste management, and community empowerment. So uh, here's where Kota Kita actually comes uh, in picture. Uh, previously, Kota Kita has collaborated with uh, Bapak de Jakarta, SDGs Team Jakarta, and also the Resilient Cities Network in producing the resilience profile uh, for <clears throat> Kalibaru and perspectives that focuses on the examining the area's vulnerability, shuffling stresses, and this also contribute to the plan for advancements of the Kalibaru hub itself and to improve the resilience of the Kalibaru. Uh, and through the assessment, we actually found that the green muscle industry is one of the essential industry uh, for the local community. I'll be sharing some pictures uh, to get the image of how it actually is in Kalibaru later and but <clears throat> uh, it also become the main source of shell waste in uh, Kalibaru and due to the industrial activities they also produce such a big amount of waste. I'll be sharing uh, the pictures just to give some exa examples and visuals. Um, Wait a minute. So, okay, can you guys all see my screen? Okay. So, um, actually, it's the green muscle industry is a very, very big industry in Kalibaru. The worker are mostly women uh, and informal workers and the amount of work they do is uh, basically they do informal work so they have to <clears throat> work on uh, a basket of uh, green muscle they peel the green muscle and during the pandemic there's a 50 percent uh, decrease in demand so a lot of the workers especially women are left with no jobs and if we're talking about the ways uh, this is actually the most common practice to throw away the shell waste in Kalibaru because the current waste management uh, cannot uh, process the shell waste itself. And because Kalibaru is such a dense community, it's, it's actually kind of hard for the waste truck to go uh, inside the area because this is right next to the seawall. It's quite hard for uh, people, uh, for the waste worker to come and pick up the shell waste. So this is actually the uh, most common way for people to throw away shell waste. Uh, and then this is the amount of waste uh, that you can see when you go to Kalibaru. And it's enough for a little children or people to actually jump outside of the wall and play outside. During the rainy season, uh, usually you can't see this much amount of shell waste because of the wave, but it also makes uh, a problem because in the docking area for the boats for the fishermen, they, it's actually blocked by the uh, cell, shell waste that is getting being carried by the waves all the way to the docking air, areas. And um, to give an image of how much, much it actually is, so actually each day um, there's <clears throat> uh, one dump truck amount of shell waste. So uh, approximately by the workers, by the tenants, and also by the local Edoe government that they produce one dump truck or eight cubic meter every day. And annually it can add up to 3000 um, cubic meters. So since you are as Charta, um, we actually focuses on the local community and 
how the shell waste can be processed in pursuit of local community livelihood and healthier living environment. Uh, we are actually working with uh, one business group who focuses uh, on utilizing the shell waste, and it consists of um, a lot of vulnerable local communities, such as women healers, uh, women green muscle healers, fishermen, and housewives. Uh, we are also empowering the women's pillar community through financial and gender perspective education. This project is designed to support the waste management system, which is still unable to process the child waste itself. And we also collaborated with experts in women financial empowerment and alternative material experts to ensure that the program will answer the needs of the group themselves. We actually focus um, a lot in practice battery activities in the start of the of the program to ensure that we actually can really map out the needs of the group themselves, what are their challenges, what are their vision for the group and for the area um, and advancement themselves. So uh, we could we co-designed uh, the <clears throat> project themselves with the group that we're working with so we can have a uh, better approach in designing the programs. We also uh, collaborated with a PPSW Jakarta, uh, a NGO that focuses on financial empowerment for women because the group itself uh, is being led by a women and a housewife. And also most of the members uh, consist, 50% of the members consist of women. So we also put um, emphasize in the importance of not only the group and organizational management, but also gender perspective to uh, ensure that there will be no future problems related to gender roles. And we also uh, work with Pleo, who enables us to work with uh, a lot of interesting alternative materials designers uh, who has more understanding of on exploring and creating new materials from the brain muscle shell reason. It has been such a big help because it gives more education to the to the group on how to actually explore the use of green muscle shell waste themselves. Um, in here, we also have some products that was uh, designed um, and explored by the networks of alternative materials and designers that working with that we are working with, and then afterwards they will give a capacity building session uh, to teach the group on how to to make all these things and to make sure that they can replicate it um, in a simpler way, in a simpler way with their limited resources and tools. Okay, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we're talking uh, we're talking here not only about economic empowerment, but we're also talking about the health of the environment and also the. Uh, financial empowerment for the women in Galibao. I think that, um, that's what I can share for where we're working on in Galibao. Thank you. Thank you, Bunga. Thank you for taking us right into community and showing us so vividly what it looks like to do this work with SMEs, empowering women, working on financial literacy and inclusion tools so that this is not just a, a one-off intervention, but something that's going to help power those SMEs for the future. And also how the SMEs are contributing to economic development and improving the environment. Um, I want to now turn it over to Ja to take us to Baguio in, in the Philippines. Um, and we know from the presentation from Nini that um, green tourism, ecotourism is a really important driver of growth across the region in Southeast Asia. So can you tell us a little bit more about the program that ADB has been working on in the Philippines and some of the lessons that we can learn from it? Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, can you see my screen? So this is the uh, uh, Baguio City uh, in the Philippines. Uh, the city is a high altitude city. So among the very, you know, very hot and humid weather in the Philippines, uh, this city is, is uh, one of the tourist uh, attraction uh, for the, you know, northern uh, areas of the Philippines. Uh, however, there is a lot of uh, 
uh, I would say shocks and stresses, both COVID or landslides, uh, floods, you know, uh, based on the you know the geo geographical um, uh, conditions uh, of 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 the city. Uh, so we have uh, ADB has designed or proposed a uh, uh, loan project, uh, particularly to support the uh, the city in the resilient you know uh, aspect, and also uh, tourism uh, development um, uh, areas. Uh, it's still a proposed uh, project. Uh, we have two outputs or two components. Uh, one is the uh, municipal uh, urban infrastructure improve improvement in the water and sanitation, uh, which involve uh, wastewater treatment plants and network rehabilitation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the output two is on the uh, tourism, not necess necessarily the walkers, but also the tourism industries, uh, productivity and uh, resilience uh, improvement. So the model that uh, we will uh, we are proposing to engage in the city is the uh, enterprise-led or private sector-led uh, network skill development uh, model, a funding model, a grant funding model based on the Irish uh, skill net uh, program. It was piloted in the Philippines uh, with the Department of Tourism a few years ago. So the the tour tourism accommodation services, the transport networks, uh, restaurants, various uh, subsectors of the um, uh, tourism uh, industry, uh, including the SMEs, will, uh, and the networks will submit uh, applications to the uh, DOT to access the fund. And then these private sector firms will collectively nominate their workers and identify uh, priority uh, training uh, needs. So as, as said, uh, it includes accommodation, food, transport, farm, operations, tour operations, creative services, and tour guiding. So you can see majority of them are uh, SMEs. So three key areas will be uh, prioritized in terms of this uh, skill training or, or capacity building. One is the uh, climate change, natural hazards, and overall resilience. Uh, this includes both uh, adaptation mitigation sites, uh, lowering uh, carbon footprints, uh, emission reductions, uh, waste management, or waste reduction, energy efficiency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, we would also like to support uh, connection uh, the with the uh, warning systems. Uh, in Baguio City, we have uh, ASEAN Australia Smart City Trust Fund funded uh, flood mitigation plan, uh, gender transformative uh, flood mitigation plan, and the uh, smart or digital uh, flood early warning system installed. So we want to link these uh, smart digital tools and and the city's you know other interventions and related uh, relate these uh, activities you know to the capacity, overall capacity building uh, to these you know private sector or, or, or the walkers and the firms. The other aspect is uh, health and safety uh, health and safety protocols, including the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, so the training uh, will be provided for safe, uh, resilient uh, sector. Uh, a few examples would include uh, behavior change uh, studies or behavior change uh, uh, campaigns, uh, awareness raising campaigns. You know, using the various materials and so on, hand washing uh, and so on. Uh, but it's not necessarily just COVID-19, but overall uh, health and sa safety improvement uh, for the sector. Uh, the last but not the least is the uh, digital skill uh, enhancement, uh, as well as the emergency response and business uh, continuity uh, planning. It's not just for uh, climate or weather extreme uh, related disruptions or disaster events, uh, but also you know other any other shocks and stresses, including uh, you know, economic downturn and how 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 would these you know SMEs and the walkers would uh, you know provide or prepare uh, for in case of you know uh, you know challenges you know coming from various uh, shocks and stresses. Uh, so this is the example uh, that uh, we are we are proposing. It's, it's not approved yet. Uh, we are proposing to to support the city and the tourism sector. Uh, but we have uh, ongoing various ongoing technical assistance, as, as we've been saying, the smart city uh, support on the you know resilience side, uh, you know climate change side, and also 
behavior change, you know, campaigns on the uh, solid waste management, uh, sludge management, and septic tank management. So the wash, you know, water and sanitation and other health sectors are also uh, part of the uh, uh, support that uh, we are uh, working on, on in the uh, uh, back your city. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Lauren. Cheers. Thank you, Joe. I think th that was very clear and important to notice how ADB is linking existing plans around disaster risk mitigation and that data and giving that access to data to SMEs so that they can be better prepared um, and that they can contribute to building resilience rather than being surprised um, by, by these threats. Um, really practical, the solutions that you offered as well around safety training and protocols. I think what, what is inherent in all of this is individual SMEs not having the access to do this kind of planning or access training sometimes on their own, but making it available across a given sector or multiple sectors really creates um, an economy of scale and empowers SMEs considerably. Again, we hear about digital skills enhancement. I think this has been a recurring theme in the different case studies. So smart city support is something that's ongoing. In, in that vein, I actually want to turn to you, Anbu, to talk about um, what are some of the trends that we see from Jakarta and Baguio. There are clearly remaining challenges, but in ASEAN, what are some of the untapped opportunities you see to do more of this kind of work with SMEs um, and really accelerate green transition? Can, can you share a little bit more about how cities and SMEs can tap more into digital technology to do this. And Job, also please feel free to, to jump in uh, after Andu's comments and, and add your thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you, Lauren, and, and uh, good morning, everybody. And if you look into this uh, ASEAN, and uh, there is an ASEAN smart city network, and uh, there are about 26 pilot cities. Uh, they have their vision for the uh, moving towards uh, smartness. Uh, um, Jakarta is one of the one of the our pioneering example where they are uh, promoting this this uh, smart collaboration. And um, so, what what um, smart city is uh, here from the from the from the perspective of uh, transition and the resilience? Uh, here, the smart cities uh, apply the ICT technologies uh, to improve the services. The services that has been provided by um, water or uh, provision of electricity, or provision of the transport. So um, we we did an analysis and we found that is the uh, smart cities um, uh, collectively can contribute for the decarbonization and the dematerialization, and as well as the resilience. And our estimate says that is the. Uh, emission reduction by application of this uh, digital technologies uh, could be in the magnitude of uh, from 16 to 27 uh, percent uh, based on that is what type of technologies that is to employ. Second thing is that during the COVID also we found the uh, smart cities that employ the kind of a dashboard approaches uh, show there is a more resilience when compared to these other cities than the second tier or the third tier cities, which has the difficulties in employing the ICT technologies. And third, uh, uh, these uh, smart cities also in near, near uh, we did the analysis for, for four cities in the ASEAN. We found uh, the cities uh, that part of the uh, smart city vision and when it is implemented, they are in a much, much better position to achieve these SDG targets uh, by, by 2030. So there are there are multiple benefits of being smart and by employing this uh, digital public infrastructure, which is a kind of a public private partnership between these um, uh, large enterprises and uh, then small and medium uh, enterprises, uh, which is emerging, and the third one is also the local government. Uh, but but the uh, the challenge here is uh, how how we defined uh, uh, this uh, this uh, small and enterprises my uh, as, as a green. And here we have uh, two categories of uh, small and medium enterprises in this region that is operating within the, the cities. 
Uh, one is one is the um, type of uh, SMEs, which which is um, in the manufacturing uh, sector and uh, which can contribute and by by employing these uh, digital technologies to become more decarbonization. Another is the type of farms that can be designated as a kind of a green SMEs where they provide the new innovative solutions. But arguably, and, and uh, these uh, definitions are somewhat uh, very vague and, and uh, it is very hard to operationalize uh, the SMEs and how, how uh, we can define this uh, green and resilient SMEs. I think that is, that is basically there is a critical need uh, for, for developing an appropriate taxonomy of classifying these SMEs and how they are contributing for the uh, green transition. Uh, another challenge, and, and now, now ASEAN is working on this uh, uh, green taxonomy, and, and uh, here we did uh, some analysis and, and, uh, uh, for these smart cities, and particularly these, these is SMEs operating within the uh, smart city framework. And we found about uh, uh, 30 to 60 percent of the SMEs are underserved by the financial market they have the difficulty in access to the finance and also they have the difficulty in access to the technology. So in fact, if, if, you, if you compare this uh, emerging and green SMEs within the smart cities, uh, they are ready to apply these uh, digital technologies. Uh, uh, we find uh, some kind of uh, a situation which is, which is similar to uh, kind of a league match. So we have a, uh, league and uh, uh, this this talented young uh, uh, players uh, are ready to play, but the field is not yet served. And are there with the infrastructure like 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 a uh, uh, lighting uh, stadium or the transport systems? So these SMEs need to compete with these uh, other um, uh, well lit. Uh, enterprises are some kind of uh, players that are well trained and with this provided with this uh, kind of a better infrastructure that is that is a, a second difficulty is that is these uh, SMEs that turn to be green is facing it so how we can move forward and and basically um i have a kind of uh, uh, three suggestions so one is one is we need to develop a uh, the, under the smart city network, and we need to develop a reporting system that can help uh, and scale up this this uh, green SMEs. There is one 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 sort of SMEs that can contribute to the solutions. Second thing is uh, some sort of SMEs, uh, some kind of startups, and they can uh, be an innovator for these uh, transformative solutions. And the second thing is. Uh, we need to have a kind of a focused approach for these SMEs uh, um, in, in, the, in the digital transition. And uh, where this is a kind of a concept of a digital public infrastructure and the green finance platforms can help. And, and uh, here we need to develop a system and that can uh, leverage uh, available financial resources made available to this uh, SMEs. There are several examples. For example, in, in, in Indonesia, and there is a PUSAT P2H, and it is a kind of a specialized program uh, for providing the soft loans for these uh, MSMEs for, with, with a variety of structures and with, uh, with the intermediaries. Um, they, they can offer the loan up to uh, 16, 16 years of um, uh, lending period or the payback period. And in, in Malaysia, they have the green technology financial programs and they, they support these SMEs uh, that is operating. But what is missing here is uh, uh, the guarantee. And, and here basically this, this local government are uh, not legally uh, given the permissions to become a kind of a guarantee for these SMEs that is operating the smart cities. So we need to think about a kind of an architecture where uh, this um, uh, SMEs and the startups um, uh, could collaborate with these local governments and uh, have this uh, better access to the um, public and the private funds. And so uh, I think this is uh, kind of a, 
three pronged strategies needed to to capitalize this uh, uh, digital public infrastructure as well as the financing facilities that is available uh, for this uh, SMEs. I stop here and thank you. Thank you, Amit. I think that's very clear. And what we we heard from you that we haven't really gotten into yet is access to capital um, and the different strategies that are necessary for either startups or SMEs, and they might be different. Um, and while there are some governments who are experimenting with this, more needs to be done. Um, John, did you want to comment on that? Uh, just thank you, Lauren. Uh, just quickly, yes, I fully agree with uh, the ERIs. Uh, 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 proposals like I think uh, it's it's also twofold uh, I think from the government or the local government side and then the SMEs themselves uh, from the government side you know adopting the digital solution or smart solutions to improve maybe in three key uh, functional areas for the cities maybe uh, one is the uh, city planning systems uh, in terms of you know overall planning and the other one is the service delivery uh, using you know municipal services as well as you know business environment you know one stop shops and you know service centers you know, those kind of uh, the last one is you know budget and financial management systems you know using the you know the 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 you know management information systems and financial management not only increase you know transparency and overall governance but also attract you know the the the, the investment you know coming into the city so and then that that creates you know, the enabling environment for the smes to 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 prosper from the uh, sme side uh, they can use the you know available uh, technology many of them are not very expensive ai and you know uh, chat box and the you know uh, the big data and so on so they can use that for you know uh, business planning uh, purposes or market uh, market enhancement or market reach and so on, as well as, you know, their, their service uh, delivery. And also for their own access to finance, you know, they need very robust, you know, uh, accounting systems and financial management systems. If they if they use uh, very good, you know, digital tools or, or even, you know, a simple Excel sheet, but properly done will help them, you know, have support, you know, getting loans from the banks and so on. So there's a twofold uh, kind of, you know, uh, position to help, you know, SMEs and so on. Thank you. Thank you, John. E each of those categories actually could deserve their own webinar. <laughs> in fact, how how SMEs can be using new digital technologies and, and AI to boost their businesses, the financial management. So thank you for highlighting those. I think there's a, a lot more that we could talk about there. Um, but I, I want to now open up some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, thank you to everyone who's been posing the questions. We have more than a dozen questions. And so I, I want to pose some of those questions to our panelists. Um, there was a very interesting question that was posed around trade-offs in, in the Q&A. And this question I want to first direct to you, um, Pak Jafari. But if others want to come in on it, please, please do. Um, the question is, you know, for MSMEs and SMEs, um, we know that they're going to be impacted. And so then will the future of job creation in cities when we're facing shocks and stresses. But very often in these situations, in particular post-disaster, governments have pressure to allocate resources to emergency management, to healthcare, um, And so how do we keep the soft infrastructure or investment in SMEs on the radar? How, how can policymakers address this tension? Okay, thank you, Lauren. Uh, and somebody is asking about this. Uh, based on the experience that we also learned from the pandemic situation uh, that also happened on two years before, our concern is still, I think, the same all the uh, in the world. Our government still has to taking care about the healthcare. Uh, they focusing on that uh, department, but how about the other uh, sectors? Yeah, uh, the programs that uh, we set up at that time is the first one is uh, we still keep uh, giving some uh, social funds to keep the people still uh, can productively uh, having to fulfill the, the, the food and then uh, the other infrastructure. And uh, we know that uh, in terms of 
to giving the programs like Jakarta Planners event and the other things. We we cannot do that because at that time there is no crowding people. We we cannot pro crowding people over there. So what things that uh, government is do uh, did at that time? We actually asking uh, the private sector. We make the Jakarta uh, Development Collaboration Network. We invite the private sector to bring the problems. First one is healthcare. The second one is uh, the economic things, yeah, because the first is the crisis for the health, and the second one it could be become the economic crisis. So through the Jakarta Development Collaboration Network, we invite the private sector to gather or to collaborate some program, any things. Then we have a platform. Uh, we uh, we made it between the private sectors and uh, people wants to uh, give it some donation or any kinds of that. And also I think uh, the other countries also uh, giving some uh, good uh, uh, support to do that, not only for the uh, local uh, area, but also outside. So Jakarta Development Collaboration Network, I think that's a good um, initiate that the uh, government of Jakarta doing at that time. Uh, that's my uh, comments, uh, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kari. I think it's really important to note the importance of private sector to private sector collaboration. And I think, again, we come back to the role of government in creating the space, right, in, in allocating the space and saying that we have an issue, we can't address all of it on our own, and making sure that there's an opportunity for different groups to work together through very difficult times and articulating what those needs are and prioritizing them. I think we keep coming back to that priorities, enabling environment and clear communication on that. And Andu, you mentioned that as well around articulating using the same language and in taxonomy in this. I think Andu, you wanted to add to this as well, please. Yes, and uh, I think that the trade-off and uh, that that exists, and uh, and I think we need to acknowledge and uh, there is a trade-off. And uh, from the from the SME perspective, and and uh, I see there are there are this these trade-offs are getting amplified, and and they are basing these multiple risk, and uh, what there is a. Uh, uh, one risk is the kind of a physical risk, and when this pandemic, like these things, comes in, and uh, uh, they they lost economic and and the, and the financial profits, and and, uh, and that is a kind of a physical risk. And the second thing is the transition risk. Uh, um, most of the time, and uh, the policies, uh, unless otherwise it is a stable, and they are not providing the long term signals for them to invest on it, and uh, because these SMEs operate with a very 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 thin margin, and they said they have a kind of. A, transition risk moving from the uh, normal to the green and uh, resilient. And the third one is also liability risk. And uh, SMEs, they need to insure themselves against uh, some of the other. other. Uh, here, this, this how, how we can address this risk and then minimize this trade-off. And here, we need to be uh, very clear about about this uh, public-private partnership. And, and uh, it's a B2B relationship. And most of the SMEs are part of these uh, uh, larger value chains and th there is a big companies and it is a most of the smart cities they they work on a kind of extended enterprise model so so and then we need a kind of uh, uh, new mechanisms or the new models where this risk are shared between the large corporations which are much more resilient and uh, which has the more potential than their smes and second thing is the capacity and capability of these local governments. And, and uh, yes, of now it is very much uh, limited and in the decision making. And then the legal provisions make them. And, and uh, there is a huge difference between the central government, the powers, and then the provincial governments and the local governments. And uh, here we need a more, more uh, subsidiarity or, or the decentralized uh, systems. And uh, that, that comes with this improved the capacity of these local governments. Absolutely critical factors of decentralization and decision making there in agency. Um, there is another question that has come in on how we can better address issues of equity 
whether that be gender equality, disability, social inclusion through this SME development. We touched on that through various presentations, um, but there's a request for additional case studies or approaches. Um, for any of the panelists, maybe Bunga coming to you to begin, um, the others, please do raise your hand if you'd like to contribute on this. Thank you, Lauren. So maybe I can share like a little bit learnings that we got from Calibero. So issues of um, gender inequality, especially related to patriarchal cultural values are very fundamental to be integrated into the program. Um, understanding the vulnerability that they have in economic se sector, women have in economic sector and other forms of violence, um, increase the chance of ensuring that future activities and development will not later develop into uh, another form of injustice experienced by these women. Uh, because uh, in gender specific burden, women often bear a heavier burden due to multiple responsibilities, including domestic work, social and productive work. And it is con uh, very crucial to make sure that the program uh, in developing women's entrepreneurship and is in a way does not um, add another layer to the burden. Uh, so uh, in CCRS, we also uh, have a capacity building session where we touch on this to all members of the group uh, on the <clears throat> uh, gender specific burden. And also we talk about um, financial um, capability, especially for women, because just because they're enabled, uh, we enable to uh, help them in making more money does not mean that they will have the um, power to actually manage the money themselves. And it can actually uh, perpetuate the existing gender inequalities in their family. And also uh, it's important uh, to also teach that as the basis. So the women uh, and the um, men themselves can also talk better with their families to explain what they're working um, at. Because sometimes uh, we face this condition where the women are unable to participate because their families does not let them. And we also uh, need to uh, tackle that beforehand to make sure that their participation is uh, continues until the uh, project ends. And also, it's also important to uh, teach about gender equality perspective to prevent conflict and also lower risk of unconscious gender discrimination and bias within the group themselves. And through these uh, curriculums, uh, we find that the women in our business group in Calibaro has gained more confidence, especially in voicing out their opinions, both in uh, their own group settings during decision-making process, or also to towards the public, to local government, and to also their community themselves. And they have also started to be more open about chunking and uh, Chunker is the name of the business group. Sorry, I forgot to mention it. But also, uh, it's it's a lot easier for them to be more active in junk, in the activities. And we also need to think about that the fact that they have burden related to their kids. So we should make sure that we can arrange the activities to fit uh, those schedules, and also to make sure that if the kids come with them, that we can provide a safer in environment both for the kids and the mother. Maybe those are what I can share from Kalina. Thank you, Bunga. Those are very real examples, right? We, we have to do the training, we have to do the work, and then create the space for those groups to show up, right? And, and to be there also, as you just mentioned, on their terms, and schedules that work in places that work in, in spaces that feel safe and supportive, so that we can have that increase in participation um, in SMEs and MSMEs. Nini. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Bunga, uh, for for answering that very important question. Um, this is not uh, super specific about the question, but I want to add that when we discuss uh, about collaboration with SME, I think we need to be actually very careful. Um, and it's it is actually more nuanced uh, and we need to bring inclusivity and equity lens for sure. Um, the collaboration between SMEs and different partners um, that local government, for example, trying to bring and facilitate um, we need to, I think, being really careful about the power relationship, for example, if bringing private sector, if you're bringing CSR, 
uh, it shouldn't be with helicopter view. I, I just want to do this. Like we need to recognize the SMEs, they're part of the local communities, they're rooted in their communities, they know about their local contacts. Um, so that will allow for meaningful collaboration, equal uh, partnership, and that will also enable a more uh, sustainable um, uh, initiative going forward. I think another thing that uh, I want to highlight is also uh, the role of local government to ensure to close these inequality barriers. Uh, in the point of view, it's actually, actually quite uh, interesting. For example, there's a example from city of Melbourne in how they approach their uh, procurement. Uh, a city a government is actually one of the biggest investors, right, in the city with their own procurement. And then in the case of Melbourne, it's really interesting in how they have a principle in uh, prioritizing uh, more marginalized communities, for example, people um, that uh, went to jail, for example, it's hard uh, for them to get uh, opportunities or job, right? And there was, uh, there's this uh, program, for example, uh, that helped to close that barrier. Uh, give uh, more uh, economic opportunity to this different group. Thank you. Thank you, Nini. Um, I think that this is really important in terms of looking at this specifically on site in different places. And there was another question that I, I actually want to combine two questions. One was about place-based waste management and examples where we've seen this. And another one was about the advantages and disadvantages that SMEs may face when they're trying to compete. And this is something that you were just highlighting, Nini, in terms of those power dynamics and procurement. Um, you know, there may be preferred vendors in certain cities. It may be more comfortable for investors to look at larger companies in particular when we're talking about infrastructure. So I wanted to pose this, this question to the panel, but, but maybe to you first, Jock. Do you see places where this is happening more constructively, where SMEs are able to get more involved in these kind of larger bids or different kinds of tenders that have traditionally been the place of larger enterprises? Uh, you're right, uh, Lauren. I think I think there's still a significant challenge there. Uh, I think particularly SME uh, participation, you know, in the overall. Uh, I think one of the questions focusing on waste SMEs participation in waste management, right? I I I type some uh, answers there as well. I think SMEs are probably one of the most important solution uh, bringers, you know, for 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 the cities in some in terms of solid waste management. Uh, reducing the waste, you know, from the end, uh, as well as, you know, participation in the waste management uh, chain, logistic and supply chain. Uh, there are so many uh, SMEs, you know, uh, walking, but many of the cities, I think at the local government level, municipal level, they recognize that. Uh, however, uh, as Nini has been saying, there are many dynamics involved in terms of, you know, how to engage them, you know, in terms of contracting, uh, procurement, and so on. Uh, Many of the, I think, uh, many of the service providers are SMEs in the city in terms of solid waste management, obviously municipal uh, solid waste management, but definitely the support and the, you know, the recognition is still, still a big uh, gap. Uh, maybe larger scales, you know, more, more medium or larger scale, you know, waste service providers, you know, some of them are already participating in the contracts like O&M for the landfill and also material recycle facilities. Uh, so there are, you know, medium to large, there are participation. However, I think smaller uh, scale, you know, businesses, enterprises, their participation, the challenge is still there. So I think it's, it's for us to, you know, support, uh, work with both the local municipal governments, as well as the SME themselves, you know, to bring them in and, you know, find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's it's so critical that we look at how we're connecting this value chain and that it's a process, right? There, there is a continuous effort that's required to support this kind of development. And that, that can start with external factors, but in, in many cases, once that momentum is built, it can continue from within the city and, and the SME community itself. Anbu, coming to you, did you want to answer that last question or a different one? Yes, and, and uh, uh, this this waste management and SMEs and, and 
Now the ASEAN came up with a kind of a circular economy framework and which is more about the uh, resource efficiency uh, and, and the role of innovation. And, and here we find um, yeah, the role for the startups and many of the startups, I think it is happening in Indonesia and Thailand and uh, even some countries like Myanmar and uh, they have a better ideas and how, how this uh, uh, resources and basically we don't see it as a kind of waste, but how these uh, resources could be transformed into, into a kind of a more beneficial uh, waste stream or the or the, or the uh, energy stream or the material stream. There is a lot of uh, ideas, and but this most of these ideas uh, are remain as an ideas. They are not transformed into a kind of a business model. And and here we need to develop a kind of an ecosystem, and and that is the that support support and, and uh, the startups uh, to come up and that need a little bit of uh, risk sharing and, and between the uh, young entrepreneurs and which are most of them are the social enterprises. And then uh, a kind of a, a financial institution, financial intermediaries. And third one is the technology providers. And, and uh, here we need to see a, a kind of a, a startup and an academia and uh, as well as the public partnership and and uh, that is very much needed and uh, but we also need to understand uh, each city has its own dna and there is no kind of a one size fit for all and and we need to identify this uh, city's dna and match with that social capital that already exists then you will find in uh, multiple opportunities to transform the social enterprises into a uh, very, very operational business model. Thank you, Anbu. I think there's a, there's a really interesting opportunity there. There is the opportunity to think about um, ecosystem development uh, with startups, with SMEs, where there's a need. And um, there was a question in, um, in the chat about the architectural response or spatial um, place-based part of this. And um, here in Singapore, uh, where, where we are based, the Singapore Food Agency has done a lot of work to create these hubs where say startups or SMEs who are doing sustainable food and local food development, which in, in Singapore is a major part of the risk factors for a city state um, food security, they can come together and they can access services in that hub as they develop as small businesses. Um, similarly, um, in New York, um, where I'm originally from, they have a smart cities hub where smaller smart cities actors come together. And that ecosystem has been really fertile ground um, for growing solutions and also the ecosystem itself and learning from one another. I wonder if any of the panelists would like to share examples that they've seen um, other examples in the region of place-based approaches, whether that's for a single sector or simply a, a space that SMEs are given to continue to grow. Bunga, please. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit from another project uh, we did in Nambon, Solo. So um, actually we talk a lot about co-design um, in the process of the program themselves, but we also support, uh, we also had another project where we support local SMEs by co-designing a co-working space for them. So it's actually uh, for the bird cage craftsmen and they mostly work on their own products uh, at their houses. So. Uh, there's limited space for productivity and there's limited space for storing their products as well. And there's just um, little to no collaboration that can be done because they're working in each of their own private space. So uh, we work with the community to co-design and improve the space um, where we together made a co-working space for all the craftsmen. So it directly improved their working condition and reduced the economic loss that came from the rain raining the bamboos used for the bird cage itself. And also it enabled the small businesses to grow together. They share their tools, they share their information about the market, their know-how, and also it improved opportunity for women to engage in economic activities because it's being done in a public area. Uh, so yeah, it's also one of the intervention that we can do 
deeper SMEs related to, to space. And besides functioning as a communal working space, it also served as a public space for community member to gather around together. Yeah, I think uh, it's one of the learnings that we can share regarding uh, intervention related to space. Thank you, Bunga. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Anbu, but I also want to note that we are coming into the last five minutes. Time has flown um, in this webinar, and I'm going to come back to each of the speakers and ask for your thoughts in 30 seconds or less on how we keep this work moving uh, after this comment. So Anbu, over to you. Yeah, I think it's related to this SME or the green SME. So one of the major challenges uh, uh, SMEs uh, facing is also to creating a demand and for for their products and particularly the green product and services. And uh, in this regard, maybe we can look into that is what Malaysia is doing. Basically, they have the green procurement policy, and uh, uh, that is a kind of uh, I think the governments are the public uh, public sector is the major major procurer, and here um, for for employing some some innovative schemes like eco-labeling and the certification and these things create a market demand, then more SMEs can come into this transition. They can contribute for the transition. That is that is my my uh, take for this last question. And there is a, we need to create a demand for this more, more, more uh, circular or more green products. And uh, uh, and second, uh, that is the, the, what is the take home messages and, and uh, mm, here, the tapping the local potential is is very much important, and and uh, and here the we, we, today we are talking about the cities and the resilience and the transition, and, uh, and the, the uh, we do have a mega cities like like uh, uh, Jakarta, but but uh, our experiences show that is the. Uh, the cities building a partnership and for example mega cities working with the second tier cities then it it create a kind of a collective capital and and uh, and and uh, which could be a good strategy that that need a kind of a, um, a, within the cities we need to develop a network and it has to be partnered with this uh, uh, academia and as well as the uh, central government to develop an, a, a framework to create an enabling environment thank Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Anbu. So we need to accelerate that vertical alignment and create more demand for these green and, and resilient solutions that SMEs can deliver on. Let me come to you now, uh, Jifari, your final thoughts on how we accelerate this work. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I think that uh, community must be different in all the words, yeah. especially we talk about the SME. Yeah. So there is no uh, single solution that works for all. Yeah. It differs with the situation and then different policies and also difference of uh, programs that uh, the government would like to take a risk. Then what is uh, uh, have to do? Yeah. Really very important uh, for the government, yeah. And then uh, the key is to understand and uh, nurture the relationship uh, with those informed. Yeah. So finally, uh, uh, that's our uh, closing uh, statement about Thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you. Understanding community needs and linking that up. Um, I want to come to Bunga and and then Nini and then uh, and then you, Joe. Bunga, but did you want to add any parting thoughts? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Less last thoughts in 30 seconds, how to accelerate this change. Oh, okay, so yes. Yeah. So um, I think understanding each community uh, is very important because they're all very unique. So there is no one size fits all solution and methods. So understanding and building relationship with the stakeholder, uh, in my opinion, is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for me, it's it's really important that we should not uh, work with silos approach. And looking at SMEs, we need to look at multiple resilience challenges so that we can really try to address uh, different issues together. And then uh, hopefully that will be more impactful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I go, Lauren? 
Thank you. I think uh, there are data, there are digital and smart smart tools, you know, all, all, all sort of, you know, applications uh, available uh, in a various, you know, uh, sections. But they're just tools and not effective, you know, without you know, properly using them, you know, in a in intended or useful ways. So we are very keen to find and help, you know, design or support ways in using these uh, smart digital technologies and tools to empower SMEs, you know, for, for cities and you know, uh, urban resilience in, in general. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank again, Nini Bunga Jifari and to my co-host from ERIA and EDB, Anbu and Ja. Thanks to all of you who have signed on online. We had a few hundred participants today in a really active discussion. Um, I, I would encourage you to take a few moments after this webinar to write down some of the lessons you've learned and how you want to follow up on this work. Um, this is one conversation that is part of a continuing body of work um, from uh, all of our institutions here. And so please do check out the point of view with the link in the chat and also the work from ADB and ERIA on this and reach out um, so that we can stay engaged and keep this work going. Um, wishing everyone a meaningful rest of your day. Thank you again for joining and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone.